The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who go, sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barn. The Gospel of the Lord. <laughs> Why is it so hard to feel grateful? <clears throat> Nothing like starting with a loaded question, right? I mean, of course we are grateful people. I witness people all the time who say, thank you, when they've received something. I see parents constantly prodding their children to make those two important words part of the everyday vocabulary. I see the gratefulness from this church and from this community for all, all the hard work that gets put into the fair each and every year. I see the gratefulness for our soldiers and veterans and first responders and the hard work that they have done and continue to do. I see the respect and gratitude you show for so many different fields of work. Farming, teaching, medicine, business, food service, even for pastors. I know gratitude is part of who you are. It's part of who we all are as human beings and as children of God. But today's bigger. Maybe I should say today is more specific. Today we want to think about the abundance that's in our midst as we think about harvest. We want to think about the gratitude that we have and the gratitude that we're called to have when it comes to what God's creation has brought forth. So let's state the obvious first. This is all coming from this here city slicker who's only ever had in, in his hand two gardens, right? Both of them in the past two summers. I remember doing the first one where Kim and I stood by the garden eventually, you know, midway through, dumbfounded, saying to each other, there's food coming out of the ground. <laughs> I thought food came off of trucks at the grocery store, but there it is. It's growing out of the ground. We never have to buy a tomato again. I wasn't that naive, I promise. But we were excited when we successfully grew something with our own two hands and with all the effort we put into it. Yet in the midst of all that effort and time and energy and money and bug bites, were we grateful for the amount of food that was actually going to be produced from the work that we would put to use? Or how about this other thing that we decided to take a stab at for the first time this year? Canning. You know that thing where you take this mountain of produce and you spend hours of planning and chopping and preparing and mixing and packing, not to mention all the cleanup, to end up with, what, five cans of tomato sauce? <laughs> sure, in the middle of winter, when you, you can open up a can of something and say, hey, we grew this, and it tastes just that much better, then yeah, we, we'll be grateful then. But not on canning day, we're not. But how about those weeds, as they were talking about? Oh, those weeds. The never-ending being on your knees, being bent over, pulling and pulling and pulling. Just to have to do it all again the very next week. But did you hear Jesus let us in on a secret about that today? Those weeds? They were planted by an enemy. The devil must have done it. Or the neighbor who wanted their garden, didn't want their garden to be outdone. 
One or the other, I'm, I'm not sure. But somewhere in the middle of pulling all of these weeds, one starts to think, you know, buying tomato sauce at the store doesn't sound half bad. Because remember, then I don't have to think about the, the farmers who grew the tomatoes and fought off all the weeds, or the truck drivers who transported them, or the factory workers who processed and packed them, or any of the other hands that helped to get that sauce onto the shelf for me to buy. It's hard to be grateful for all that we have at all times, isn't it? In our reading from Deuteronomy, the Israelites, they were given a command. But it seems like you could almost hear it as a, as a reminder. Moses tells his hearers, more or less, hey, remember all that stuff God did for you? You know, freeing us from slavery and oppression, delivering us from Egypt, showing our enemies his mighty power, bringing us safely into this wonderful land, and then giving that land to us, a land flowing with milk and honey? Did you remember to say thank you? Remember, this wasn't our land in the first place. None of it is. It's all God's, and God has given it to us along with all the other stuff that comes out of it. The least we can do is give back to God a portion of what comes from this land. It's hard to be grateful. Even those Israelites who experienced that abundance firsthand still had to be reminded, as we heard, to show their gratitude to God for what God had provided. All of those stories show us that being in the middle of the situation or in the middle of a process distracts us from realizing our gratitude. We have a different opinion about gardening when we're out in the middle of the garden on a hot day pulling weeds than we do in the middle of winter as we open up a can of homemade tomato sauce and, and think longingly about the seeds that we're going to plant in the spring. We think differently about the fair when we're standing in the hot stand slinging juicy burgers or in the hot garage gluing flowers to a float than we do when we look back on it in a month or two and miss it. The Israelites thought differently about a free land that day that they entered it than they did after having lived in it and grown accustomed to it, right? It's kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of like a corn maze. I've been thinking a lot about corn mazes. It's fall, right? Have you ever been to one? Been through one? Some of you? None of you. Okay. Well, so a corn maze is where, you know, you cut paths through a cornfield and you have to find your way from one end to the other through all kinds of twists and turns in the middle of it. And so when you're in the middle of it, what do you see? Corn. All you see is corn. Just a path and rows and rows of corn, corn that's taller than every one of us, which is why we get lost. It's not until you make it through it or come out of it and can get a bird's eye view of it that you realize the scope of it all. You know, there are some that even have their paths of the maze cut into messages and pictures, but you can't see them until you have an opportunity to look back or look down to see it to see that those paths that you get through. And so you have this one here that says, you know, thank you farmers. And then you have another one, which is my personal favorite, you know, the ravens, but um, okay. <laughs> anyway, how can we then be grateful for what God has given us when we're in the midst of the situation, when we're in the middle of the maze, or when we're in the middle of life? That's the question I believe we're called to wrestle with. But it also begs the question of why do we, should we be grateful? What's the big deal if we're not grateful? Are we hurting God's feelings by not saying thanks? Do we think, not think God can handle that? Are we, you know, we're not saved by work, so we're not doing it for a pat on the back or a star in our crown. Well, I think gratitude leads us to abundance. That might be a leap, so let me explain a little bit about that. When the Israelites and the ancient Jews brought their gifts and offerings, their first fruits, when they brought those forwards, what happened to them? Or when we say we're giving our gifts to God, what happens to those? 
I mean, they don't float up into the sky and disappear into the heavens so that God and the angels can have a merry feast. Gifts that were given to the temple were used to feed and pay the priests and the temple workers so that the work of the temple could go on and continue, and that could be a, continue to be a place of encountering God for all the time to come. But that got abused, as we heard so often in Scripture. But some of those gifts and offerings were then given to the poor and the orphans and the widows so that they too could be cared for, just as God commands. It's kind of the same thing how the gifts and the offerings that are given to the church, well, they aren't used to pad the church's bank accounts or pad the pockets of the pastor. I mean, they're used so that the church and the pastor can further the church's ability to serve God's kingdom and take care of one another. When you tell someone, thank you or good job, you're encouraging them for the work that they'll hopefully continue to do. Gratitude leads to abundance. And abundance leads, to closer, leads us closer to the fulfilling God's kingdom among us. We hear Paul encourage us this in his letter to the Corinthians today. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As we give thanks for harvest, all of us, not just farmers giving thanks for what's been produced in their fields, our gratitude leads to abundance that's in our midst that we sometimes don't give thanks for. And so we're called to give thanks and we share a portion of what's been produced because it is only through God's goodness that we have any of it to begin with. And it's through this abundance that's shared with one another that we can truly make this world a better place. Thanks be to God. Amen.